are listening to the immortal finger of Chico Marx. Chico did to music what he did to the English language. Here he is in recital. Brothers Council Podcast, Episode 14, Look at Ciccolini. To get started, let us meet our panel. First, he is the founder and administrator of the Marx Brothers Council and a prolific author whose books include The Annotated Marx Brothers, That's Me, Groucho, and the just-released Movies Are a Conspiracy, Selected Essays on Cinema. Please welcome the Honorable Pandu of Muftan, <laughs> Matthew Conium. Thank you very much. And I feel today like uh, Colonel Hawkins of the record department. Who? it's windy. <laughs> it's a real hurricane blowing, and one of our trees has just crashed into the neighbor's garden. Oh, my goodness. It's devastation out there. <laughs> <laughs> you will persevere through the storm. Next, he is a film, video, and audio editor, including of this very podcast. So let's see if he takes out all the nasty things I just said about him. He is an inveterate <laughs> researcher whose archival deep dives have enhanced the annotated Marx Brothers and That's Me Groucho, as well as the daily experience of Marx Brothers Council members, visual storyteller, Bob Gassell. I think what you're trying to say is that I haven't written a book. Is that what you're trying, <laughs> trying, trying to avoid? Saying? <laughs> I assume nothing, Bob. How are you doing, Noah? <laughs> Very well. I am indeed Noah Diamond, writer, performer, Groucho recreator, Marx Brothers revivalist of I'll Say She Is, Gimme a Thrill, etc. And finally, our special guest for this episode is one of my favorites. We could spend hours just listing his credits. Let's do that. <laughs> As author, playwright, performer, producer, critic, speaker, and founder of the American Vaudeville Theater. But to leave room for other things this episode, I'll uh, just mention his great books. No Applause, Just Throw Money, the book that made vaudeville famous. And Chain of Fools, Silent Comedy and Its Legacies from Nickelodeons to YouTube. And his invaluable blog, Travelanche, which if you're a listener to our podcast, you are probably also a reader of Travelanche. He is a member of the MarxFest Committee, headliner of many MarxFest events, and the producer and director of I'll Say She Is at the 2014 New York Fringe Festival and consulting producer on the 2016 production. The one, the only, Mr. Travis D. I'm not the dummy. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Uh, well, Trav, uh, why don't you tell us something about your early encounters with the Marx Brothers, what they mean to you, and how you found them? In junior high, there was this kid named Russ Silverstein who was doing the viaduct routine. And I, I, that, that might have been my first uh, exposure to Chicoisms. And I felt really inadequate that I didn't know. And, and the reason I felt inadequate was that he told me I was inadequate. <laughs> so, and this is long before we had things like uh, home video and such and uh, so my interest was peaked and then it wasn't year, year, years later my my long-term steady girlfriend was a classic comedy fan and uh, really sort of immersed me in it and I just totally fell in love with it have your feelings about the Marx Brothers uh, evolved or changed over the years yeah you well I like most people, I'm not fond of their the last half of their movie career. And as time goes on and you've really, really, really absorbed the movies you love uh, to the point where you feel like, well, I don't need to watch it. I can just um, recreate it in my head. I, can, I don't need the DVR. I can just watch <laughs> the movie in my head. Uh, so it's been interesting to try and watch the later ones now and try and find the good in them. Uh, I, I think you'd be surprised if you watch them with audiences. I bet, um, you know, sort of fresh faced virgin audiences would uh, laugh more than you think that they might and enjoy it more than you think they might. And if you're there with them, uh, you might get more out of it. 
so that's that's one and that's one way that I, I've been trying to sort of re-engage with them after all these years. Did you uh, talk to me recently about a, a positive experience you had had with room service? Yeah, you know, and the, it helps. We, you know, I, I never had a, a large screen TV before, among other things. So, uh, one gag in particular, you know, they're all starving and they're waiting for the food to come, and it finally comes, and and then they all gobble it really fast, right? And then <laughs> after that happens, Harpo, who's been acting just as hungry as the others, pulls a banana out of his pocket. <laughs> and eats it, and he didn't, not only does that, then he pulls another banana out of his pocket and he eats it. Well, all this time, he had no reason to be hungry. Uh, so, but if you're watching that on a crappy little TV, you're not going to catch that <laughs> gag. Um, and yeah, and I just sort of, sort of try to watch it with uh, with a liberal yeah. spirit that this isn't going to be a Paramount movie. This is going to be what it is, you know. And enjoyed it a great deal. I've seen them all at least once with an audience. Every single one of their films I've seen with an audience at least once. I've never seen any of them go badly. And uh, yeah. my my only memory really of seeing Love Happy, which I've only seen once uh, with an audience, was was the man sat next to me at the end turning to me and saying, I enjoyed that, as if it was a revelation, you know, <laughs> because you, you put them in front of an audience and they're pretty much they all work. They really do. Room service, Love Happy, Go West. If you're in a packed house, they all go over. It is true. There is a big difference between the sort of critical or analytical eye that, that we watch these films through, uh, particularly in order to discuss them and write about them, and the way most people sit down to watch a comedy in a theater, which is in a great spirit of generosity. You know, it's not uh, arms folded, you know, oh, go ahead, make me laugh. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm here to laugh. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, I know everyone was hoping for an episode in which we chastise Ciccolini and Pinky for their cruel mistreatment of Edgar Kennedy, or <laughs> pitch a streaming animated series based on the creamy prom commercials. But instead, we present our first episode focused on one particular Marx brother. Of the three who get the most attention, he's the one who gets the least attention. <laughs> Perhaps the most enigmatic of the brothers, and of the three headliners the one who left behind the smallest amount of first-person insight. And money. Yeah, <laughs> and even less money than insight. <laughs> Leonard Marx, born to Sam and Minnie in 1887 in New York City. On stage, he was essential. Off stage, he was even more essential as the dealmaker responsible for many of their important breakthroughs. On the other hand, his personal peccadillos or chickadillos were... <laughs> personally and professionally damaging in a way not approached by Groucho's shortcomings or, or Harpo's if he had any. Trav, um, it's been clear since our first episode that you would guest with us at some point. And we thought this might be the episode because you've argued very convincingly for Chico's equality within the team. And I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I've heard you refer to him as your favorite Mark's brother. Uh, yeah, at times. And, you know, I'm, I'm also uh, a, a dramatist of sorts. So uh, when I write comedy, boy, it's easy to write jokes for a character like Chico. But, you know, I had this, I, th- this insight uh, when thinking about the show. For, and and I'll, I'll back into it. It, it occurred to me, uh, of the brothers, his character in the movies is the most autobiographical, if you will. Um, and then it occurred to me, you know, we're accustomed to thinking, I mean, yeah, those of us who are into their backstory and stuff know that, uh, that Chico was their manager and sort of an off screen leader in a way. Um, it occurred to me that uh, in a way, and, and we're accustomed to think of Groucho as the on-screen leader because he's so verbal and stuff. But uh, if you think about it, as the eldest brother, he kind of set the tone. He set the metronome for the the f- dynamic of how the brothers were in real life. And it spilled into what their act was, this sort of criminal, <laughs> uh, you know, scheming anarchistic low life who doesn't uh you know they don't none of them respect laws or institutions and uh you know they chase every skirt they meet and um and in a way even though groucho founded the act uh technically as a child star in a way the founder of the of the 
act in reality is Chico. Well, it, it is interesting that he he is the one who seems to have found his character first. Yeah. Uh, you know, in those those team ups that he had in vaudeville with uh, Arthur Gordon and Lou Sheen. Yeah. He he seems to have been doing that Italian character before Groucho and Harpo were had stumbled into their familiar roles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but beyond that, I'm talking about, you know, as a guy who plays in whorehouses and, uh, you know, uh, sneaks out and gambles uh, away his money at the pool tables and, uh, you know, pilfering and all of that stuff. The stuff that winds up in their movies, uh, you know, how is it that Groucho and Harpo even evolve these characters who are in the same world as that? Like, how does that even come about in the first place? Because, you know, if you, um, you go down any, any number of vaudeville comedians, that's not their shtick. You know, it's only the Marx brothers shtick really. Yeah. That's interesting. So the, the uh, milieu for a lot of the Marx brothers work was a more natural habitat for Chico maybe than for the others. Yeah. 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 Right. Going, you know, going back to the, the classroom sketch, you know, it's about disruption and anarchy and, it would have been interesting to see if prior to Chico's joining, they were so, you know, it, it, they were such hellions. But I, it feels like when he comes into it, uh, it becomes about improvisation and, uh, you know, causing a ruckus on stage and off stage and not having the decorum you were supposed to have in vaudeville. You're supposed to be very disciplined in vaudeville. And they were the antithesis of that. The actual day that Chico joined his brothers in the act, um, if we believe the legend, um, is, is exactly what you're talking about. He jumping up on stage and surprising them. Yeah. Uh, isn't that the story that he stood in for the piano player in Waukegan, I think? Uh-huh. And then they threw fruit at each other, as I understand it. <laughs> yeah. Just to get that national anthem to sing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I seem to remember, you know, they did a little bit of cutting up when they were the four nightingales and, and Groucho was supposed to be the little German butcher boy and stuff and th- some sort of fledgling stabs at comedy. But in terms of the, the kind of stuff they did when they were the school act and stuff, it seems to happen when Chico comes into it. Matthew, uh, in the annotated Marx Brothers, uh, you observe that uh, Chico seems to have wandered into his characterization for want of anything else to do, and then simply outlived it, so that by the end he was representative of no comic style other than his own. Yes, yes, meaning the the ethnic characterization, which which at the time you know was was absolutely to a penny. There were uh, you know funny Italians and funny Irish and funny Swedish and 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 you name it. Um, he just thought, thought, it was almost as if he thought, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that then. Um, but then having, having sort of acquired that, he stuck with it. And his comic characteristics as they, as they become, uh, familiar in the film aren't really anything much, much to do with that. And, and, and by the end, um, when there aren't Italian comics everywhere, whether, where there is basically just him and, uh, what's he called? Henry Armetta. And that's about it. Um, it, it almost seems like the most, uh wild surreal character of of them all you know there's this there's this kind of iconic wisecracker there's a mute and then there's this this funny italian who nobody can decide if he is italian or not he has his own uh extremely obtuse logic uh he's duplicitous and in, in, in an extremely amusing way and when i think of the films really uh, when i think of the really big laughs when i think of the times when i've been sort of crying with laughter He's usually around. It's usually the scenes with him and Groucho, uh, the scenes where he outwits Groucho, um, and reduces Groucho to, to quivering jelly, um, are, are almost all my, my favorite scenes. Um, and just some of his, some of his lines. I think he gets, I think he doesn't get, uh, enough of the good lines, but I think he does get some of the best lines, some of the best jokes. Uh, then we save money on chairs is such a, such a good joke, you know, <laughs> and, uh, the, the, the house okay. next door and, and all that stuff. I mean, I think for, for sheer laughs, um, I would have to put him right, right at the top. And it, and it's very, very interesting to see how he kind of built that that comic persona up not only uh you know from 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 modest beginnings but from uh stock beginnings for me uh the most interesting thing about chico was figuring out uh how seriously you're supposed to take him uh, uh the character that is not not the guy um 
He'll say the most totally ridiculous things, but uh, sometimes he's totally serious, and other times it's followed by, hey, that's a some joke, eh, boss? <laughs> you, you just never know where he's coming from. Um, a good example being the auction in Coconuts. You know, is is he stupid or is he trying to annoy Groucho? You never really know. We'll say three hundred, three hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, four hundred, four hundred, five hundred, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred. What the heck, I care. Um, <laughs> it, I, you suspect he's just having fun ruining Groucho's plans, but you you can't be sure. He's kind of dumb like a fox sometimes. Yes, uh, he seems to be. Um, you know, his bewilderment uh, is there when it works for him. I guess by the time they get to MGM, uh, there's usually some sort of motive behind uh, his irrational talk, uh, whether it's taking advantage of Groucho or stalling with the aviator speech. But uh, I think I prefer it when he just did it for no reason. He is the most ruined by MGM, yes. He's the guy who carries the luggage and yeah. brings yeah. the car around front. and he wants to help with those kids. Um, I, I think there's this a certain level at which he's he's you know neither he's there's a level at which his exchanges in the paramount movies are are uh vaudeville crosstalk that's just planted in there and you know there's not supposed to be any real conviction that there's reality that's supposed to carry the plot along you're just Mm -hmm. laughing at jokes for the sheer effect of jokes the italian characterization seems that although it had some element of social parody or I, I suppose not social criticism but <laughs> it had some social currency when it was new but it seems to um in the 30s evolve into strictly a vehicle for humor that that was uh, unique in the team i mean you could write puns for chico that groucho couldn't pull off um because of that dialect the extra a sounds and the yeah. just the music of his voice uh, lent itself pretty well to puns that I think, you know, writers like Kaufman probably wouldn't have tried to get away with in anyone else's mouth. I just wish we could hear the the act when they all had various uh, dialects, when Groucho was a German and when uh, Harpo was the Patsy Brannigan. And Gummo, uh, I th- I, sometimes he's referred to as, uh, you know, the Yiddish character sometimes as more of a the ingenue guy. Hmm. Uh, and then sometimes I, I think I've heard Groucho referred to or read Groucho referred to him as a Nance, like a, you know, guy who's kind of light in the loafers. Yeah. Um, wouldn't that be amazing to hear them all to do their, they basically, they'd all be Chico in that scenario. In a way, his, his character was um, maybe more consistent with the other, the rest of the team in those days. But yeah. it's interesting that although Groucho and Harpo had yet to really evolve into their characters who are familiar to us, the Marx Brothers were already an established comedy act when Chico joined them. Yeah, And I, I, I don't see any evidence that what Chico did with his brothers was any different from what he'd been doing with those previous partners. So I can't really make a case that he developed that character specifically in order to provide something the act needed yeah well that's what they all did that back in the day Mm -hmm. do you think it's possible that he uh, was responsible in some way for the marginalization of the fourth marx brother like when it was groucho harpo and gummo um perhaps they were more equal but now that uh, the big brother is here it means that gummo and later zeppo is going to not be left with many table scraps yeah, possibly. Yeah. yeah, you know, I get when I, I was just rereading Maxine's book, and she she made she had an interesting observation that uh, that uh, the off screen Zeppo was too much like Groucho, and so she had a theory that Groucho didn't like that kind of competition, uh-huh. uh, which, hmm. which is something I'd never heard before. Because hmm. I always think of uh, Zeppo being referred to as being more like Chico, in that he was you know kind of a roughhouser and. Yeah, he was trouble. Yeah, went to the track. <laughs> Bob, in our uh, Marx Brothers in the 21st and a half century episode, uh, you raised the question of whether aspects of the Marx Brothers' work um, could be or perhaps are seen now as being politically correct, politically incorrect, or offensive in ways that they weren't then. Um Preparing for this episode, I I did a a fairly uh, deep internet search Mm -hmm. trying to find 
any testimony by anybody accusing Chico of, um, you know, uh, offensive caricature. And I really couldn't find much of that. Well, there was that guy in uh, the big store, the... uh... That's why I'm looking for something that don't look like a bed. Well, you're going to worry no more. I got to trust the thing you want. Well, get a flash and a microphone how I talk. I know microphone. I'm the same national like you. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty surprised by that, though. I mean, the generally the only references like that I could find were people talking about other Italian characters and mm-hmm. saying, oh, he's doing like a Chico Marx thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I did find an interesting essay um, by someone named Ed Liu on a website called Anime Superhero. Uh, this guy, Ed Liu, identifies something he calls the Chico Marx effect, which has to do with not being offended by Chico while being offended by things that don't seem that different. Uh, he, he, as the example he gives is that he hates Charlie Chan, the Charlie Chan movies mm-hmm. and the use of yellow face. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he says, he says, this is Charlie Chan. I hate him. This is Chico Marx. I love him. And then he struggles to figure out what the difference is. So do I. I guess when you're talking about nationality, you get a little more leeway than when you're talking about race. I think that's right. There's nothing about Chico's appearance that is uh, necessarily. Uh, well, his costume is, is, is yeah. you know, a parody of, a, of, a, of an Italian immigrant, isn't it? Yeah, he looks like he should have the the organ grinder monkey, you know. The, uh-huh. But um, there may be there may be an aspect where it's so phony and so counterfeit that there's no danger of it. You know, it's not like you know people get offended at uh, the Godfather or Goodfellas or something because it really makes you know a certain ethnic group look bad. But if you're as, <laughs> if you're so unrealistic as Chico is, then there's little danger of being mistaken for somebody you might encounter on the street. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and maybe there's something about, um, although certainly in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, Catholic immigrants to the United States certainly were discriminated against, but we don't really think of Italians as a, as a marginalized group. I don't think in, in well, North America, Sacco and or... Benzetti is the big case of where, ah. you know, but you're right. There's not, we, we're accustomed to thinking of that thing of no dogs or Irish need apply. And obviously right. African Americans and anti-Semitism. And you're right. It, it, Italians don't seem as to have been as demonized quite as much. It is interesting though, isn't it? In, um, in the actors, it finally evolves. Chico's sort of um, fresh off the boat status um, it, it, it is relevant to his relationship within within the team, isn't it? I mean, Groucho is uh, you you imagine started out like Chico, but but earlier on, and and, he, and he's achieved what Chico is mm. trying to achieve. He's he's got in. He's uh, he has got his foot foot yes. in the door, uh, however fraudulently. Uh, and then suddenly in comes this new character, or, or usually pair of characters, whom he recognizes only too well. And Chico recognizes him too. And so they team up sort of on that basis. And that's kind of the explanation for why there's a love-hate thing between Groucho and Chico, because Groucho sort of sees himself five years ago, ten years ago, or whatever there. Yeah, that's interesting. They're at different. Um, they're at different moments in assimilation, and therefore yes. at different levels on the uh, immigrant food chain. Sometimes Harpo is Italian. <laughs> that's never dealt with. Sometimes he's Tomas. You know. Yeah. Well, he talks or... with his hands. <laughs> Harpo and Chico are often cast as brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, ma- making Harpo, I suppose, also Italian in, in those cases too. Wacky Ravelli. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so through the vaudeville and Broadway years, Chico is very rarely celebrated in reviews, in, in press about the team's act. Uh, his piano work often gets a nod, uh, but it's really not until the films that he gets any sort of attention. Um, and even so, it's it's less than he deserves for being a comedian. I, I wonder if Chico grew into his role, although we, we seem to think of his character as something he decided kind of on a whim and then just stuck with for 60 years. <laughs> um, but I wonder if, uh, I wonder if he got good throughout the teens and twenties. Or he, he, you started me thinking along and another 
line. There's a way of looking at Zeppo that there's a joke to the fact that he's not good. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he's that he's there to sort of poke fun at the usual role of the male ingenue or whatever. And maybe, uh, and you sort of get a sense that, you know, if any of the four of them are the typical, archetypical uh, vaudeville performer, it's Chico, it's almost like he's doing, uh, cheerfully, happily doing bad vaudeville routine. Um, and gra- it, 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 in a way, the entire act is kind of subversive in that way. Because if you ever watch... Henny Youngman or uh, uh, early Milton Berle when he's just rapid fire firing those jokes. It sounds very Groucho-esque. So there's a there's an element to it that they're like this encyclopedia of uh, of vaudeville, you know. And so on some level, you're not just laughing with them; you're laughing at them a little bit. I sometimes think the the great strength of Chico as a comedian is is in his timing. I, I mean, I guess that's true of any comedian, but uh, Chico had, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the best comic timing I've ever heard. Yeah. Heard. It's, it's so, it's so good. It's so <laughs> rhythmic. And it makes sense that as a piano player and a, and a, a with a good mind for math, uh, that he would be a, a, a master of rhythm. Sometimes he'll, he'll take that beat and it's just a beat, but it's just the right amount to make the joke really hilarious. Now, what is it that has four pair of pants Lives in Philadelphia, and it never rains, but it pours. That's a good one. I give you three guesses. Now, let me see. Has four pair of pants, lives in Philadelphia. Is it male or female? No, I don't think so. Is he dead? Who? I don't know. I give up. I give up, too. Yeah, and it, and and again, the dialogue gives him all these extra syllables to make it a little <laughs> even more <laughs> euphonous. Do any of you guys have any recollection of your initial impressions of Chico when you were a child first watching the films? I do recall thinking that he was the friendliest of the of the main three. Uh, you know, Groucho was confrontational and Harpo you know, usually freaked people out. But Chico usually engaged people before confusing them or taking advantage of them. Um, I guess you could see why someone like Miss Judy would befriend them as opposed to uh, one of the others. Um you know, when they went to MGM, he sort of took over that role from Zeppo as the portal to the real world. And, you know, he, he had, the, he had the, the engaging personality, which allowed them to use him that way. Uh, yeah, it's even though it, it does seem like a violation of his character, his surface qualities lent themselves well to that kind of avuncular, um, harmless uh, immigrant character. But I never, re- I never really gave him a, a lot of thought when I was younger. But then I, when I, I was, you know, in junior high, I was a big fan of the team. And uh, Welcome Back, Cotter came on. And we- <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really funny you mentioned that because I think my first uh, experiences of him were secondhand in, in like you know impressions by people like Robert Hedges and yeah. Um, I there was he the characters were rendered in like a Mad Magazine parody once. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I probably read long before I saw them in the movies. One thing I was going to ask was um, a, an awful lot of um, his persona, his appeal, uh, what people know about him now is is heavily informed by what we know about the real man, by his his uh, profligate mm-hmm. sexual tastes, by his gambling. Uh, and all, and, and all those things. Um, I would imagine anyone coming to, to them, uh, certainly from my generation onward, certainly now, uh, that's, that's absolutely not only public knowledge, but also very much at the heart of how we perceive him. But presumably through his, through his actual active career, uh, that, that predated, uh, the general awareness of that, didn't it? Meaning people saw the performances and didn't know the backstory. Yes, without without that You're being saying, such yeah, a heavy right, informant, right. which I which I would argue is certainly the case now. Yeah, well, look at what I was trying to suggest earlier. I feel like it bubbles into the their act. You know, like in the coconuts, they they steal from the cash register. You know, mm. and they steal wallets and things. I feel like you know why is that even on their minds as comic material i think it's it's kind of like who they were how they ran the streets in yorkville you know yes yeah right yes it's not stealing well then i couldn't do it <laughs> <laughs> he, he just feels very very authentic in that way doesn't he yeah we we do often ascribe to his character things that were true of him in real life 
that are sometimes to be found in, in the films, but not always. I mean, I, I don't think, um, you know, uh, prodigious sexual appetite is ever... <laughs> no, but no, that's, really that's Harpo, character. isn't it? And he occasionally restrains him. Yeah, yeah. Chico occasionally says, no, no, not yeah, now, not yeah. now. We've got, to, we've got to do this, you know, yeah. And I, I think that's, you know, uh, but the, the germ of it initially is Chico and it trickles to the other brothers. Again, I'm reading Maxine's book. When Chico got married, all the brothers put the make on Betty, Chico's mm-hmm. wife. They're like <laughs> constantly chasing girls. And that winds up in the movie and, and like literally manifested. So in, even though Chico's character doesn't do that per se, mm-hmm. uh, I, I feel like his brothers sort of took, took uh, leaves from his book, you know. I love the one moment in uh, the day of the races when Harpo has found out that uh, that Fo is going to be framing uh, Hackenbush and he, she, and he wants to go communicate it to, to to Chico and he goes finds him and he's like entertaining like a gaggle yes, of girls yes. and, and, with a blindfold and, and Harpo has to pull him away. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. That is a I mean he's unquestionably, you know, interested in women, but um Oh, and then the the moment in Horse Feathers when they all put the make on Thelma Todd and he comes and he gives her a smack on the face. I mean a kiss, not a hit smack. <laughs> and says, Now do you want any ice? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but the gambling never really comes in, does it? I mean, if you look at Abbott and Costello um, in their early films, they're constantly gambling, aren't they? But I, I can't think of many occasions, if any, where well, the, the bridge game. The bridge game, yes, yeah, okay. But I mean, again, that's crackers. that's a social ritual, isn't it? Which he which he subverts. But it, you would think he mm. might be constantly, you know, constantly laying little bets on things, you know. Mm. Um, but as we know, Chico had um, perhaps the least input into their scripts uh, of all the brothers. And it's possible if he had been more in on the crafting of these stories maybe they would have focused more on his uh, yeah. you know his personal preferences <laughs> um, well what about the real life chico he he's the hardest to know certainly of the three major mm. marx brothers because as we've often noted he he didn't write a book he rarely gave interviews and when he did he was almost never personally uh forthcoming about anything um, we, we've been encouraged to find him lovable in terms of his, <laughs> you know, personal foibles. Um, I think he was probably lovable, but also caused a considerable amount of pain for mm. the people close to him, including mm-hmm. his brothers. Um, it, is this another example, like the, like the Italian character of Chico being uh, a product, a product of his time. I think irresistible is the term, isn't it? Is that's what his what his, what his daughter ah, said was, yeah. was you know you couldn't you couldn't help but love him. In other words, you know you you probably would would want to, but he was just so overloaded with charm. But he is a strange mixture, isn't he? Of of extreme simplicity, it would seem. I mean, obviously we're all only going by other people's accounts, uh, but also complexity. You can never really put your finger on him. I, mean, I think even with I mean, maybe I, maybe you disagree on this, but I would think of of all the of all the common addictions, gambling is probably the most mysterious to to anyone who doesn't share it because it's obviously a fool's game. Uh, you don't have to be a smart mathematician to know it's a it's a waste of time. But he was a smart mathematician, um, yeah. and yet to 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 devote your life to it in in such a ruinous way. Um, and, and, and not even with the excuse of, you know, he was, a, he it was always, um, tied up with sports, you know, and you can get caught up in the excitement of a sport, perhaps. But when you're at a stage when you would literally put a bet on whether, you know, um, your next door neighbor is going to come out with his briefcase in his left hand or his right hand, which is apparently what he was like. Um, you're looking at a, a, a truly irrational <laughs> compulsion, and he seems to have been a very rational man in other ways. So I think there is a there is a, a great deal of of complexity there that we'll never really get to the bottom of. Now, it's just such a contradiction that he was so bad with his money and so forth, but the team put him in charge of their business affairs and their contract. Mm, yeah, because he was so so good with numbers and so canny. Yeah, it may be that the same. Uh, qualities that yes, made him yes. such a problem gambler m- gave him exactly the right uh, nerve to try to make it in show business right. and, and make these deals happen. He's a bold risk taker. Right. Whereas Groucho was was not that way. He was not expansive and not inclined to sort of socialize for the sake of seeing what would turn up, you know. Mm-hmm. I think the harshest uh, 
critique of Chico as a human being I've ever come across uh, is in the Marx Brothers scrapbook. This is what Susan Marx, Harpo's wife, of course, um, had to say about Chico in the early 70s. She says, Chico didn't value people or anything. He liked to gamble and didn't care what it cost and what it would take away from his family. He was a most inconsiderate man. I think he gave less to people who loved him than to anybody. He didn't share the good things of the world with his family. He was always up and away. The people who loved him were the ones who never knew him well. Uh, obviously, from her personal position in the family, she had all kinds of extra reasons <laughs> to feel that way. Mm. Um, but uh, it's pretty unsparing. Although Maxine would, you know, very much contradict that, wouldn't she? There's that very fascinating bit right at the start of her book of her confronting Groucho about the scrapbook and the things he said about about Chico. And she's very, yeah. very keen to stress uh, that for all his faults, which were obviously considerable, um, that kind of criticism, she, I think she would, would argue, doesn't really hold. Yeah, that he was uh, as much a victim of his problems as the people around him were. Robert Bader, in his book, um, tells a story about uh, Maxine talking to Uncle Groucho to try to get insights for her book. Um, and according to Bader, Groucho's response is, my advice to you, if you are writing a book about your father, is to make up your own material. Nobody remembers. <laughs> Which is what Groucho did all the time, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Justifying his own uh, <laughs> writing process, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, well, for Maxine, you get a real sense of affection, you know, and and uh, I mean, she had a lot to have to forgive, uh, and and yet she did. A lot of people would not have done so, but obviously, she was susceptible to his charm. It seems like it might have been very important to Maxine um, and to uh, her son uh, Brian Culhane, who who helped her write the book. That, to kind of set the record straight and, and make uh -huh. a case for Chico's importance. And I think she really wanted there to be a book about Chico um, since there were books about Groucho and Harpo. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, some one of the oft told tales about, um, about his marriage has to do with Betty, Betty saying something like, you know, no matter what he does, whenever I hear his feet on the doorsteps, you know, I get excited. Mm. Um, you know, basically, I, I'm, I'm still madly in love with him, even though he has hurt me so much. Um, but it does seem like a sort of publicity friendly version of a very painful situation. I'm guessing it was a different story when he heard her feet on the doorstep. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing all hell broke loose. <laughs> he leapt out the window, yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, if I can, um, if I can uh, hog center stage for a moment, because uh, one of the most important Please. things about uh, Chico is that, that, that there is so very little we know about him. I've actually compiled a list of my my top five favorite Chico news items. Um, if you're a member of the mm -hmm. Marx Brothers Council Facebook group, you'll know that Bob has uh, has just very recently reposted the all time classic, the uh, a, a newspaper in where was it? Was it Lincoln, Nebraska? somewhere in Nebraska. uh yeah, yeah. point yeah. Uh, published a story that uh, chico's plane flew over and didn't stop um which is which is yeah. a, <laughs> a, really, a wonderful thing to, to put in the news um but here, here are <laughs> well they ran out of gas and they had to go back <laughs> here, here are five other uh classic chico news stories um in in fifth position is the story of him trying to sue warner brothers over being mentioned in the film Rhapsody in Blue. And according to uh, which newspaper you consult, the reason he wanted to, to sue was either because he was quoted in the picture as endorsing certain piano playing techniques which he did not approve, or because the film gave the impression that he once played piano in a theatre in a cheap neighbourhood. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can you can you imagine? <laughs> uh in position number four we have the Milwaukee Journal of the sixteenth of October nineteen forty nine, which tells us Chico Marx is negotiating to buy as girls go by, he will of course play the Bobby Clark part. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> wait, Chico will play the Bobby Clark part? Yep, apparently. In position number three, we have the, the, the Reading Eagle, 30th of November, 1956. Paddy Chayefsky is writing a play for Chico Marx. 
Very nice. In second place, we have the New York Post, 11th of March, 1941. Checo told reporters that henceforth his movie role will be Grimbles, a Greek, instead of Ravelli, the Italian. (laughs) But my all-time favorite in position number one has to be the San Bernardino County son of January the 12th, 1941. Checo Marx was sued for $15,300 today by a theater patron who charged he fell over the movie comedian's feet at a showing of a Marx Brothers picture in a Hollywood cinema house. Lewis Rudner, a salesman, declared he suffered a sprained shoulder and numerous bruises because Chico's feet completely blocked the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So Chico is attending a Marx Brothers movie. Yes. Is that it? Well, they're, they're, they're watching a Marx Brothers movie and Chico is there and this guy yeah. trips over Chico's feet. <laughs> <laughs> and sues him. For <laughs> and sues him. He deserves to win for chutzpah. <laughs> It's interesting you point out the Greek thing, uh, Matthew. I just only yesterday TCM showed a short with George Guivaux, who in his whole shtick was that he was he, his character was Greek, and so that was a thing. You know, maybe maybe it, it put a bug in his ear to like, maybe, <laughs> or maybe the reporter was just bullshitting. <laughs> but, so, can I ask a question here? No. What time is it? No. Uh, um, <laughs> no. No. Uh, Are you enjoying the show, Tom? <laughs> Did did Chico do himself a disservice by not uh, evolving or abandoning his character uh, once we got into the 40s and beyond? Could he become a character actor? I'm sure he would have loved to if the others were were forthcoming, yeah. I'm sure he had the talent to do it. I mean, I would have loved to see him in some, you know, semi-serious acting roles later in his career. But I don't know. Maybe there's more of an argument that he did himself a disservice by abandoning his comic character. I mean, I don't know if we can imagine like a, a quiz show in the 50s hosted by the character Chico played in, in the first few films. <laughs> <laughs> Although I am imagining it and it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you bet they are like. It's pointless, you know, all the wrong answers to all the questions and yeah, it would be fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it demanded this supply of great material. And I think Groucho had the kind of mechanism of wit to elevate bad material when he was saddled with it. Um, Chico seems to have not been a judge of material. He'll he'll say what's ever on the page. And uh, I get a real sense that in the 40s, uh, younger people were really down on vaudeville's style humor and things were changing really rapidly. And, uh, and Italians. Yeah, well, no, no, real Italians, you know, Sinatra, you know, and Lou Costello, those people were flourishing in the 40s. It's, it's, so I think like real Italians were in, but uh, what the place for Chico would be in that is, gets kind of confusing. Right. Sorry, you're not Italian enough. <laughs> What's what's the uh, Grouch? I, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. The, Groucho's second solo movie that he does with Sinatra and uh, is it Dorothy Lamar? Double Dynamites, Jane Russell. Jane, Jane Russell, Jane Russell. Uh, Double Dynamite. I I when I watch that, I'm like, it, it would never happen in a million years. But I'd rather have Chico in the role yes. of a waiter at an Italian restaurant who's a gambler than Groucho. Yes, it doesn't make yes. any sense for Groucho to be that guy. Yeah, I suppose it was always true that Harpo and Groucho both had maybe more of a fan following. I, I mean, are, are we aware of any attempts to do for Chico what they were trying to do for Harpo in, in Love Happy? There are some stories, there are some reports, but I, I can't imagine there was any ever anything and much to them. he had that sitcom. Them. He had his sitcom, he had his uh, College Bowl series. Uh, there was talk of him being yeah. in a western called called Dusty Trail, but uh, that uh, that was a Lester Cowan, so it was probably all horseshit. I I don't know, but um, there's lots of reports of of things he might be in, but he he never is. It never comes to anything. His best chance was was being a band leader. You know, he had a real real shot at that. I think he he, he could have you know he could have he could have succeeded with that, but I think he just he just spent everything before it came in again, didn't he? Yeah, I, I think especially at that point, he really was just feeding the beast of his mm. gambling addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the search for personal insight into who this man really was, uh, one is constantly confounded. And a good example of that is a letter 
that I stumbled upon in the Groucho Marx collection at the Smithsonian, uh, which uh, Matthew has spoken about uh, quite a bit. It, it's a letter written from Chico to Gummo in 1947. Oh, yes. Chico yeah. was in London. Uh, appearing with his... Yeah, exactly. The most revealing thing about this personal letter is that he misspells Gummo's name. <laughs> <laughs> G-U-M-O. Uh, you, Matthew, have rightfully um, presented this as evidence that they weren't nearly as hung up on their names mm. and how to say them <laughs> as as we sometimes are. Um, but, you know, you find a personal letter from Chico Marx, it seems like, uh, it, well, it is a very rare find. Uh, but he doesn't he doesn't offer much. But again, he's giving nothing away, is he, in that letter? There's nothing personal. There's nothing familial. It's uh, it's very, you know, it's 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 uh, fully literate. You know, it's it's perfectly written. It's it's in a nice hand. But there's no yeah. there's no personality there, is there? Except that you know that the the basic the basic point of the letter is is he's doing someone a favor, isn't he? He's he's suggesting to Gummo that the the British comedian Max Wall might make um, a, a, a good uh, client for his agency. Yeah, right. He's putting in a word for mm. this other performer. Mm. And um, the rest of it, yeah, it's all business. Dear Gummo, received your letter and naturally was delighted to hear from you. <laughs> I, I mean, it doesn't sound like any chicken no. match we know, but then again, we don't know him. When they moved to MGM... Uh, the story obviously is that that Chico was um, at the very least instrumental, if not the the sole engine of of, of getting them that contract. Certainly, he was he was a large part of it. Um, as we all know, at that point, their billing changes on screen. Chico, who had always oh, been yes. third, moves up to second, and and this came up in the the Facebook group this week. Uh, somebody was uh, it was Roger Stevenson was arguing that that he thought that was arbitrary, it was accidental. But billing is never accidental. Um, billing is one of the most carefully worked out things. That, that, that there is in the whole of, of movies. And Chico... Especially when it changes. Yeah. Chico moves up to second when they move to MGM. The, the sh That can only be something he asked for. I, I can't think of any other reason why that would have happened. He said, you know, we're, I'm getting you this new contract. I want to go up to second. And that points to that... Unless Harpo has to be left. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Harpo, yeah. But I mean, you know, it, it, it's it's a side... It, it, that kind of business side of them is something that we don't think of and, and kind of don't mm. don't really want to because we think of them as a gang, as a team. Um, but, but I can't think of any other reason why it would have happened. And I can't believe it would have happened accidentally. Uh, I mean, it didn't. It couldn't. So he must have asked for that as one of the as one of the terms of their new contract. I want to go up to second. So that points to a, a much mm -hmm. keener, um, you know, business uh, person, you know, in terms of how he perceived himself in the act. And then at the same time, he's happy to to let his actual role in the films get get diminished to almost nothing as they went along and and if the stories are true not care so long as he he gets a certain number of lines regardless of what they are so again we're looking at a <laughs> at a at an enigma there mm -hmm. yeah it seems like we're we have a constant thing with the marxists that we constantly complain that they didn't seem to care as much as they should have <laughs> mm. towards the end mm. <laughs> and yet in that one strange way you know he did we often, just because of the lack of first-person testimony from Chico, we're left to make inferences about how he felt. And so the idea that he wasn't a strict judge of material and that in real life he was this carefree or devil-may-care kind of character. So we say, well, you know, Chico seems to have thought uh, the big store was just as good as horse feathers. Um, but we also know he was a, a smarter man than that. You know, another aspect of this we didn't touch on is by the time by the time you're getting to the 40s and stuff, he's getting up there in years and, you know, tired. At some point earlier, he'd blown his knee out and then he had heart trouble and uh, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. You know, I, I think he was just kind of going through the motions in those last. He would have been he would have been completely retired if he hadn't uh, needed the dough. Yes, yeah, that's the unfortunate thing, isn't it? He's the, actually the only one of them who didn't want to retire, and and there's we found some very, very sort of um, poignant yeah. uh, interviews where he's saying, you know, I don't know why Groucho wants to 
throw the act in. I just hope that in a couple of years he'll get over it and put the moustache back on. He's constantly popping up in the trade saying, oh, we're going to we're going to do something new together. We're going to do a remake of Animal Crackers in color. We're going to do something on television, <laughs> you know, and it, and it always, you know, w- w- one suspects, uh, you know, the, the, the buck stops at Groucho. Um, it is a, it is a, a great shame that he just didn't feel he had any kind of viable identity outside of the team because it, it led to you know the inevitable frustration, particularly in the years of You Bet Your Life. You know when 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 Groucho was was riding so high and and Harpo was very comfortable and and you know not not terribly healthy himself but very comfortably semi retired. Um, he's just this this kind of little boy lost, isn't he? It's very sad, really. Mm. What do we think about? Uh, uh, we we have often made the point that um, we're so quick to praise Harpo as a physical performer that we uh, ignore Groucho, who was also a brilliant physical performer and 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 uh, was was uh, just as proficient at getting laughs with his body as he was with his voice. Uh, what do we think about? Chico's physicality. <laughs> I, I definitely uh, took note of, um, during the, uh, rehearsal process for the 2016, I'll say she is, uh, Amanda Sisk, who directed that production, was uh, trying to convey to Matt Roper, who is a brilliant Chico interpreter, um, what the physical performance was and how Chico often seems to be sort of rocking on his feet. Rocking on his feet, yes. Uh, that the elbows are always inside. Yep. He's still, a isn't hunched. he? He's the center point. Yeah. He's a very still, you, you, you sense that, that, you know, there's an awful lot of fire contained in there, but he's still, he's <laughs> biding his time. He's watching other people. He's very sly. Um, uh, and yes. particularly in those first two films where, where they preserve the theatrical structure, he's very, very reluctant to do anything physical, isn't he? And I, and I think, um, he's sort of diluted a little once they do start running up and down the decks of ships and things. He doesn't do it badly. He does it extremely well. But I think his character, the slyness of his character is, is very, very, uh, fascinatingly presented by this strange still figure who who obviously knows far more than he's letting on and he watches and he observes and he comments and uh yeah he's um he's a he's a very very um charismatic character in that way he 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 holds your eye without without doing much which is you know what charisma is isn't it yeah, yes. He often, uh, seems to be, when he's speaking, um, he points at things a lot with his thumbs. Sometimes things that he's specifically talking about, but sometimes it just seems kind of gestural and, and random. Um, and it, and it's all very, uh, contained. He's sort of tight in a way like this character is a guy who's ready to go into hiding at any yes. moment. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that, uh, when people are speaking, to him he's often not looking right at them as, as if he's, yes. formula- he's formulating yes. his own thought and his own world and also it's interesting isn't it but when uh, an awful lot is made of the fact that harpo is transformed when he starts to play he stops being this this demonic dervish and becomes uh, a lovable angel chico also changes when when he when he sits down to play but what happens is he he looks at the camera and he smiles and he sort of winks at you and it's much more, uh, you know, Harpo gets lost in music. Harpo shuts us down when he plays, whereas Chico acknowledges us suddenly for the only time when he's playing, doesn't he? Yeah. He pours on the charm when he's playing. Mm. He's like seducing everybody around him. Yeah. He's sort of saying, actually, I'm, I'm good, aren't I? It's, that's what I get. It? So, <laughs> good, aren't I? You know? Yeah, I think that seduction is exactly what's going on. And, um, on one of the Dick Cavett interviews, Groucho talks about Chico's success with women. And, um, I think the exact quote from Groucho is when he played the piano, dames would fall down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can see that Chico kind of knows that when he plays. A- another contrast between his solos and Harpo's is Harpo taking the harp so seriously and we know that he one of harpo's favorite things was to talk about the harp and and with other harp players and experts he he loved his instrument and and uh, took it i guess as seriously as he took anything whereas chico would kind of crack his knuckles soak his fingers (laughs) sit down and you know just uh here's my act 
I suppose we do have to talk about that that piano playing, don't we? Which is which is so much a, a feature of him shooting the keys and so on. Is is uh, you know probably the thing he's most uh, known for. And it and it is a it is a wonderful kind of halfway, isn't it, between a musical specialty and and comedy. It's it's kind of it's not it's not overtly comic playing comic music but it but the the way his fingers move about and, and and do those extraordinary things i mean people do laugh when you when you see them in the cinema people laugh at, at his at his extraordinary dexterity in those in those musical numbers oh yeah unlike harpo he's much more in character when he's playing with harpo yeah. where he becomes this other being yeah the harp solos add this kind of ethereal magical whole other dimension to harpo whereas the piano solos seem it's totally believable that this guy Chico is playing might have this gift. It's low down and saloon sounding as opposed to something that you might hear in a concert hall or, you know, and by virtue of the instrument. Like, it reminds me a little of, um, you know, Jimmy Durante, you know. Yeah. I, it was interesting to me that uh, Maxine said not not accurately. I don't think she said that he was the only one who had... Uh, a decent solo act. And I was like, hmm, well, Groucho knocked him dead at Carnegie Hall. But, um, you know, there's something about him, he, as opposed to Groucho, who kind of needed to uh, bounce off of other people and, and ad lib in that way. And uh, Harpo, who's completely silent, you'd have to have like a, I don't know, some sort of mimo play or something for him. Uh, Chico could just sit down and do a song set and, you know, open, and put some pattern jokes around it. And he's got a ready-made cabaret act, whether he's got a whole orchestra or just him and a piano. Is there a precedent for that kind of playing, though? I don't know. I mean, obviously, I, I guess Trav would, it would be exactly the right person to ask. But in, in vaudeville, you mean, was, uh, was you mean there a is specific? That, that particular, the, the way he uses his hands. I mean, Andrea Orlando, as we know, has, has, has very persuasively argued that there is a very definite sexual dimension to that, the way he uses his middle finger and and just sort of sort of seem, seems to almost stroke the keys you know produces a sound without you know as well as that as well as that shooting trigger yeah. finger there's all those other moments where he kind of just just brushes the keys and yet and yet produces the full sound yeah so he's, he's deceptively you know i mean yeah. i think you know other people have said yes, yes those fingers could just find the G-stick. exactly yeah I mean, were there other vaudeville acts who, who played piano in, in a, you know, in a novel way like that? I mean, obviously, it's very, very hard to see, isn't it? Unless you're in a movie. Yeah. You, you don't get it those close-up effects. One thing that occurred to me, it would be terrific if you were alive today because you could do, a you know, a, a live video insert and everyone <laughs> would see it in close-up in concert. Um, yeah, but I, I'm... In, if he has one unique uh, genius in the act, I think that that gimmick is the only, it, you know, the equivalent of like Harpo is sui generis. There's nobody like him and there's nobody like Groucho. The only thing that Chico does of which nobody else does anything remotely like is that that playful piano playing with the strange finger motions. I especially love his piano work in Animal Crackers because although it's probably not his his most virtuosic performance um, because it has so many jokes running through it and it's interrupted for dialogue. It, it feels like the Marx brothers entertaining at a party or, or perhaps in vaudeville. I can't think of the finish. That's strange. And I can't think of anything else. Do you guys have any other uh, piano solos that are favorites or are, are noteworthy? I love the one in Horse Feathers because he's really he's really uh, putting the make on Thelma Todd. You watch it, <laughs> and it's working. I feel like they're uh, they're not acting. There's some real chemistry in that scene. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, that's all for the first lesson. I come back next week and teach you how to breathe. And don't breathe until I see you again. Yeah. I mean, I love them all. I could watch him play piano forever. I just, I just, I just find yeah. it extremely entertaining as a, as a, as a punter, as a paying customer. I, I really do relish that act. You know, I, w- I could go and see him play for an hour. Um, I, I love, absolutely love them all. I mean, mm-hmm. as we know, you know, there's no need to get into it again, but I, I do resent the way they're cut down in, in the MGM films. Um, but right up to the end, you know, the one in Love Happy where he's doing the, the you know, with, with the guy with the violin. Um, I could just, I could watch those fingers for hours. Well, in, in the last movies, very often I feel like the musical interludes are the only watchable portions, really. I mean, the big mm. store, that thing that Harpo does with the like Hall of Mirrors or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Harpo's Harp I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, this is okay, you know. <laughs> Uh, it seems that this was an, an Harpo and Chico both had this advantage. I mean, if they just had to entertain people, um, they could always play their instruments and Chico, especially because pianos are just more ubiquitous than harps. Um, Groucho never quite had that. He needed either, uh, his own intellectual resources or, or excellent material in order to entertain people. Although he did have, you know, he could play the guitar and, and that's true at the piano. He was actually much better than. All right, I take it up. <laughs> Although when he did the Con- the Carnegie Hall concert, I think, he- did he have Harry Ruby with him or someone? Marvin Hamlish. Uh, Hamlish. Hamlish. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, this is Marvin Hamlish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if only Chico could have uh, made it to the 1970s oh, and, oh. and been part of that revival. Um, I, you, you've lamented that we never got to see Chico on the yeah. Cavett show. Or on, and, and walking on halfway through at Carnegie Hall, you know, on... on, on unbuilt you know it just he strolls on can you imagine people rising to their feet and clapping it's such a shame besides you know chico totally smoked weed <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes i'd bet money i'd bet money that he smoked weed i would too and i i think he's the source of the the, the, um, the marijuana grab bag. yes the grab yeah. bag yeah, yeah a yes. little marijuana <laughs> yeah yeah, well, he's often, I think it's Groucho who said Chico had more fun than the rest of us put together. Mm. <laughs> Although the one thing Chico was not adept at was uh, imitating Harpo. We must uh, say uh, that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was yeah. I've Got a Secret. He he shows up in, in Harpo's costume, and his secret is that he's actually Chico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there does become, I suppose, partly because he didn't take great care of himself, um, his... Uh, very late appearances. Um, there is something sort of undeniably sad about his uh, physical appearance um, in in some of the the latest television appearances. It's just so unfortunate that in his last you know real real performance in The Incredible Jewel Robbery, what was he like seventy three? Mm-hmm. That he had to give a strictly physical performance. Yeah, <laughs> it's a joke. Um, Harpo does, I guess, well enough for himself, but Chico's talents are just totally wasted. Yeah, and then Deputy Seraph, obviously, what survives of that? He's a piano player. I'm a piano player. I fix a him. Yeah, it is. It is a, a pity. It's yeah, and sad. being prompted mm-hmm. from off stage or from off camera, um, so clearly because he needs the prompting. The other thing I, I think I suppose to 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 um, cover is is the uh, the whole Chico needed the money. Thing, which is a uh, anyone who's yeah. who who is in any way involved with with Mark's fandom knows that that's a kind of a, a a comic catchphrase now because Chico needed the money and the idea was that the, almost almost everything you see of them in their final years was because Chico needed the money. Um, it, it, obviously, it's not entirely true. Um, it's important to to stress that that Chico always wanted uh, a Marx Brothers revival he he never wanted them to stop and he always needed money so so there was no real you know the, the idea in particular that a, that a night in casablanca was made because he he was he owed money to gangsters and was you know was going to be shot and i mean obviously they just give him some money they wouldn't make a film they wouldn't they wouldn't <laughs> hire writers producers music writer you know and, and, and mount a film and spend a year on it um, that they didn't want to do just to give him some money. They had plenty of money. They'd give him some money. The the obviously a night in Casablanca came about because Groucho had gone a long time without much work, certainly without any film work. And as I as I as I uh, 
hint in my book, it it seems very, very likely that Gummo actually held back the offer of Copa Cabana until after Groucho had signed for Night in Casablanca because he wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, so the, that you know, Gummo was very much shopping around uh, a Marx Brothers movie to various producers at, at that point. Uh, similarly, Love Happy uh, sort of came about because because Chico needed the money, but but only in a very roundabout way, which is that uh, Lester Cowan asked them to do a Marx Brothers movie, and Harpo said no, and Groucher said no, and Chico said yes. So so Cowan. <laughs> Cowan then yeah. went back to Harpo and said, well, look, you know, Chico's on board, you know, would you reconsider? And it was at that point that Harpo thought, hmm, hang on a minute. I, I, I do have this project that I've been waiting about six years to do um, that is basically my film. As long as Grouch is not around, I don't suppose it'll be much of a problem if Chico is too. So that's that's kind of how Love Happy came about. Chico was was signed first, or was was mm-hmm. you know Chico ag- agreed first, um, and then uh, and then Harpo ca- came on, and then it was the kind of the final insult was was when it was eventually packaged as a Marx Brothers movie. But but the the, the most interesting I think it, for, for for Chico fans story in relation to that is is how they were paid. Um, very much like the characters in the film um they were they were doing it for love or harpo was doing it for love and they didn't receive any um payment up front they had a percentage share of the profits and um chico is full of this in in the trades he says uh, i'm all for making pictures in which in which we own a share this is the first picture where we've never taken a dollar in advance but uh, what the paperwork shows is that in actual fact cowan had loaned him eight thousand five hundred dollars against <laughs> his percentage <laughs> payment and oh, no. uh, the the splendidly uh, groucho-esque named ih prince metal who was the attorney for uh, for the the production company wrote to Lester Cowan to say uh, I I was quite appalled when I was informed that you had executed a check on the the account of Artists Alliance to your own account in connection with expenditures for your personal attorneys and expenditures to Chico Marx which are not covered by any of our agreements from a personal point of view I must <laughs> confess I am particularly shocked and greatly disturbed so it seems almost certain that once those profits did come in as as small as they were uh chico basically paid back a loan <laughs> wow here's, here's something i find sad is that uh, chico has a columbus bit in monkey business and he's got a columbus verse in everyone says i love you and horse others and then in uh the story of mankind He's relegated to the role of Columbus's friend. <laughs> <laughs> and you and don't Chico even notice be, him. I think, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, the first time I saw it, I missed him completely. Yeah. I was like, where was Chico? <laughs> However, isn't it true, Trav, that you compensated for that somewhat? Yeah, I did write a pl- I wrote a play in which Chico was Columbus. <laughs> a female Columbus. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Chico needed the money uh, meme uh, seems to have begun with Groucho. And just this morning... I was kind of flipping through the Marx Brothers scrapbook, letting my eyes land on Chico's name wherever I saw it. Um, and Groucho constantly says Chico needed the money. It's his, <laughs> his explanation for everything, like from 1955 <laughs> onward. And obviously Gilbert Gottfried has, has turned it into a number one hit. <laughs> well, we've avoided it long enough. Shall we talk about the great roller derby fiasco of 1949? <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Well, uh, Chico, at the uh, ripe old age of 64, came to Paris to help promote a roller derby by putting on a uniform skates and uh, promptly got flung over the rail. <laughs> Luckily, he recovered and came back and scored 17 points uh, on a jam to win the match. <laughs> this is all preserved on film, by the way, which uh, we'll post on the blog. And, uh, you know, it was a new direction that I guess Chico chose not to pursue. Is that really true? Some of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he does look suspiciously like a tailor's dummy some of that time, I must have. Yeah, when you see the film, it's obviously used a double in a Chico hat and wig. But uh, there are a few seconds of him actually on skates. I wonder what, I wonder what he took home for that. How big a check he got for, for subjecting himself to that. Well, how about the legacy of Chico Marx? We've talked a lot about the legacy of the Marx Brothers and, and 
their influence on comedy since. Uh, it's pretty easy to identify um, comic artists who have been obviously influenced by Groucho or Harpo. Um, is there any any place where we see Chico's specific influence in the comedy that followed him? Robert Hedges in Welcome Back, Cotter. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, Jack Oakey and uh, The Great Dictator? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be stuff like that, you know. But it, again, Chico didn't really own that sort of dialect humor. Um, but I think there are times when people sort of do homages to him, for sure. I think there is a, you know, a, a fairly recurring comic figure, though, isn't there, of the completely um, um, inscrutable genius stroke idiot i think that is a kind of a, a comic architect Do you know what i mean you're like um what's his face in taxi you know uh, christopher lloyd that kind of thing or um you know coach or woody in cheers you know that that strange combination of of extreme mm-hmm. wisdom uh emerging from idiocy that that's that's yeah. a, a kind of a small archetype that I, I I can't think of many things before him. Uh, I'm impressed with. that you know these, uh, Matthew. No, uh, no, I know my stuff. <laughs> I thought you shut off the TV uh, when uh, when it turned color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's tempting to see uh, strains of of Chicoism in subsequent dialect humor, um, but I don't I don't know that I do. I used to try to compare him to Peter Sellers' work as Inspector mm-hmm, Clouseau mm-hmm. and, and other characters, and uh, maybe a little, um, but actually there, I don't see a lot of similarities other than the fact that they're speaking with exaggerated, comical European accent. I mean, I guess if you wanted to push it to its limits, I guess you could say Borat was the ultimate expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In that way, I suppose, I, you know, just a guy assuming an accent that's not natural to him for comic effect, particularly a kind of exaggerated version of an accent. Mm -hmm. You know, here's something interesting. There are people with real accents who exploited them for comic purposes, like Desi Arnaz and uh, Mm. Lupe Velez, you know, and maybe that's kind of where stuff of that nature went. Cause they, I think the comedy effect of what they did is similar, but it's, it's an exaggeration of their own actual accent. In a strange way, even though it's so ever present in Chico's performances, it's kind of the least important thing about mm-hmm. him, isn't it? Yes, yeah, exactly. And also, yeah. he slips he slips out of it. You know, when there's there are moments where he's it's like you're not Abe Kabibble. You know, that's not yeah. it's got nothing to do with <laughs> Italianism whatsoever. You know, there are moments where when it suits them, when it suits the comic material, he'll shift out of it. I, I was oh, yeah. lucky uh, in that I, I was able to spend quite a bit of time with Frank Lazarus, who who plays Chico or played Chico rather in um, um, Night in Ukraine and also in the the radio remake of of Flywheel, and I and I asked him a lot about about Chico and uh, whether he felt um, that he that Chico was underrated, undervalued, and whether he was kind of a standard bearer for Chico. And um, he said that he hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but yes, now I said it, um, he he did, he did uh, feel kind of proud that, that he was, um, you know, uh, of all the brothers that he could have been uh, keeping alive in that sense. He was glad it was Chico because he felt he was the least under the least valued. And and we talked about the accent and, and uh, Lazarus does a, an absolutely superb Chico because Chico is very difficult to do because he has an accent, but he also has a voice and most impersonators Mm -hmm. just do the accent and they don't worry so much about the voice. So they just sound like Italians or or cod Italians. Um, But, but Frank Lazarus said to me that the, the key to finding Chico was that he doesn't really do an Italian accent first and foremost yeah, right. he has a new york accent and then there's a very very thin bit of italian pasted on the top was how he <laughs> described it and i think that's fair enough isn't it absolutely i think matt perrin is on the record somewhere saying that on at least one of their projects chico used to ask him for line readings because 
Perrin did a better Italian accent than Chico. <laughs> and I always think, well, that's not hard. That's not a hard <laughs> <Yes>. claim to <laughs> make. <laughs> and, and maybe in a way, that's one of the saving graces of Chico's character, why it never really comes across as a caricature in, in any kind of demeaning way. Um, because he's, it's, it doesn't seem to be based on any kind of observation of Italians. Although I suppose it, it does originate in, on the streets of the mm. Upper East Side. <laughs> Uh, one of the most frequent arguments for Chico's importance is that neither Harpo or Groucho was, was all that, um, comfortable as a character on screen without him. And, you know, as we all know, there's very few Groucho and Harpo scenes. Um, it's usually one of them, uh, with Chico. Um, but even this kind of, it argues for Chico's importance by saying he was important to Groucho and Harpo's, you know, screen presence. Um, Chico's lone importance uh, is, is, I think we've probably uh, established pretty well, but any of the three of them, um, they were more important as a team than they were as individuals. And Chico's reliance on Groucho and Harpo um, is, in a way, confirms that, um, that the team was always greater than the sum of its parts. But specifically, I think with with Chico, um, I would say that the the thing that the the i most kind of associate with him or or take from from his performances is, is that i am somebody who has seen every one of their movies far more than anyone was supposed to see like all of us you know the idea was you go to see them uh-huh. once maybe twice uh then television comes along maybe a couple times more video okay maybe once or twice but nobody was ever intended to see their films as much as we four have seen them we've seen them a ridiculous number of times <laughs> so now at this point when i've seen them dozens and dozens and dozens of times it tends to be chico that 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 i that i watch the most and get the most from uh groucho and harpo are absolute masters they are peerless but i i i i've got the measure of them i know what they can do and it's Mm. it's chico who can still occasionally just surprise me with a look or a reading or something um chico is the one that i haven't quite got the same handle on um he's a he's a a loose a loose cannon a free spirit in a way that i think uh perhaps because we know more about the real gretch and the real harpo from their from their autobiographical writings perhaps because he's a more of an unknown quantity but he's a more of an unknown quantity i think in the films I agree. Yeah. There's a subtlety also. Um, some of what's funniest about Chico is not really in the jokes as much as in the his attitude, his manner, and his small reactions to the things that the others are doing. I, I have a cool quote here from Groucho in 1942, if you'd like to hear it. I would. He's a diminutive, dynamic combination of Ponzi and Casanova, who disregards all the laws of life and constantly snaps his fingers in fate's kisser. He gambles with everything, but who knows? Maybe he has the right idea. (laughs) (laughs) Even though he looks like an idiot and talks like an idiot. (laughs) All of which leads me to conclude that the Marx Brothers Council podcast was hosted and produced by Bob Gassell, Matthew Conium, and Noah Diamond, and edited by Bob Gassell. Our special guest this episode, Trav S.D., Please, by all means, join the Marx Brothers Council of Facebook for an ongoing Marx Brothers celebration and conversation. You can read Matthew Conium at marxcouncil.blogspot.com. You can read Trav SD at travsd.wordpress.com. You can find out all about me at noahdiamond.com and Google Bob Gasell. See what you get. We're on Twitter now also. Oh, good point. Yes, we are on Twitter as well as YouTube um, as the Marx Brothers Council podcast. If I may, I'd like to recommend vaudevisuals.com because I'm being brought to you today through the courtesy of Uh, vaudevisuals.com. Yes, our good friend Jim Moore and uh, another great resource on the web for entertainment junkies. Hmm. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. Thanks for being had. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone check out uh, Trav's blog. It's, It's really wonderful. Thanks, guys. And, of course, you've known, not just from the beginning of this episode, but probably from the day you were born, that episode 14 would end with this. What is the first number? (laughs) Number one.